I'm going to read the entire book, which is 25 verses. And um, it is really part of the reason we're doing this, which I'll come back to in the introduction. But so helpful, so kind, so gracious of God. You know, this is a, a big Bible. It takes um, a lifetime to understand it more and more, and it's still full of mystery for all of us, to all of us. And yet, the Lord gives us, at points, one book, one chapter, 25 verses, and in an overwhelming day and age, it can really ground you. You don't have to worry about every chapter in Scripture for the next few moments, but instead, 25 verses of good news that ground you, that uh, you can feast on, soak into, that you can read over and over. So that's part of the reason we're looking at this book as a, just a grounding element in a chaotic age. One chapter, one book from the New Testament. Listen now to God's Word to you. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called beloved in God, Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy angels, of his holy ones, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, 
building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself, yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we think of the denunciation that we have just read of those devoid by the Spirit and realize our great need for the Spirit. We pray that we would be full of the Spirit even as we turn to the words of the Spirit, to the Spirit who called us internally, the Spirit who keeps us enabling us to persevere, grant us that same spirit. Enlighten our minds in the truth of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a wonderful Greek word that we use in our everyday English. Maybe not something we use every day, but occasionally you will hear this tremendous Greek word, Microcosm. A microcosm. A microcosm comes from the two Greek words, micro and cosmos. A microcosmos or a small universe is the idea. Something like the universe is so great and vast, it's really inconceivable. But you might get somewhere by a model of it, something small, a microcosmos will enable you to conceive of it a little bit better. What is wonderful about the book of Jude is that in 25 verses, in one book, towards the end of the New Testament, you have a microcosm, a microcosmos. When you think of the Bible, you have 66 books, 1,000 189 chapters. It's enough to overwhelm just about anyone. And we live in an overwhelming age. We live in the data age, the age of data overload. And it is grounding and healthy to realize that God in his great kindness, gentleness, mercy has given us at points microcosms a microcosm of the good news, a small universe that summarizes all sorts of gospel truths. If you children think about beginning to learn of fractions and how they work and how uh, one pizza is typically cut up into eight different slices. So one pizza slice, I'm from New York, I call it a slice, one pizza slice is one-eighth of a New York pizza. Well, you know that if that bottom number, that denominator, is very high, like 1,189, that one slice is very small. One over 1,189. That's what you have in the book of Jude. Just one slice of 1,189 chapters. But wow, there is so much good news packed into that one slice, that one over 1,189, that it's a book you can come back to over and over and over and you can say, you know, life is crazy. I can't think of the whole sweeping narrative of the Bible. It's overwhelming to me like so many other things in my life. But I have the book of Jude, 25 verses. I can read them over and over. I can divide the verses I understand from the verses I don't understand. If you begin doing that now, we'll come to those verses you don't understand in a few weeks and hopefully provide some ways to understand them better. But not only is the book of Jude a microcosm of the whole Bible, 
the first three verses are a microcosm of the rest of the chapter. In the first three verses, you have Jude covering, really, what he's going to spend all 25 verses addressing and working through. So we're going to look at the first three verses this morning. And I want you to keep that concept in mind. I want this to be grounding for you, devotional for you, a, a way to focus on a very finite number of words and really bring them into a, a better understanding in your heart and mind. But I also want to observe something um, remarkable that Jude does with just a tremendous economy of words. With so very few words in just three verses, he ma manages to up the ante, so to speak. He manages to take something that's already very serious and then say it's even more serious than that. So what we're going to do as we reflect on these three verses, first we're going to consider, and then as the text directs us, we're going to contend. Not just consider the truth of God, but we're going to begin contending for the Word of God, and we'll understand a little bit of the difference as we get to that second point. But first, let's do some considering, just how the Bible works. It opens up with these verses and never get to the point where you say, oh, those are just the boilerplate template beginning verses of any epistle. These are words written to the church. They're written to you, even as they were written to this initial audience of Jude, this initial congregation. And there's beautiful lessons here for us to consider. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Just in that half verse, a tremendous lesson, beautiful humility that you might not initially recognize. You see, this is not Judas Iscariot who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ and was dead by the time this letter was written. This is certainly not Judah from the Old Testament or the tribe of Judah. This is a man who was named Judah, here it's shortened to just Jude, but it seems he was mentioned as a brother of James, and that James, and therefore Jude, were half-brothers of Jesus Christ himself, Matthew 13, 55, and Mark chapter 6, verse 3, mention Judas and James. James, of course, being James the Just, who wrote the book of James, and now we come to James's brother, Jude, opening the epistle by saying, if you want to know who I am, James is my brother. You may have heard of him. He wrote another book of the New Testament. But isn't that glorious humility right there? doesn't start off by saying, I'm the half-brother of Jesus Christ. It doesn't start off by saying that at all. He doesn't start off by saying, yeah, God became man and dwelt among us, and I'm his half-brother. Instead, he says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. It's glorious acknowledgement that saints are also sinners, that when it comes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and James, the brother of Jesus, and Jude, the brother of Jesus, they were sinners of like passion as we who looked to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, thereby becoming saints and servants. Jude, half-brother of Jesus, saying, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And then he addresses his original audience and yet does a very beautiful job of addressing you here today, every church that has read this letter, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. If you think about the call being an inward saving call of the Holy Spirit, that point at which a sinner goes from darkness to light, 
in which someone's heart of stone forever goes away and becomes a, a heart of flesh, when somebody is born again, redeemed by grace through this supernatural call and work of the Holy Spirit, if you think of it in those terms, you have in the second half of the verse a reference to the Trinity. Called by the Word of God through the Holy Spirit, effectually called to saving grace by the Holy Spirit. As a result of that, beloved, beloved in God, what did God pronounce over Jesus at his baptism and at the transfiguration? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Jude says, do you see this? Called, brought into the household and family of God, a son or daughter of God through Jesus Christ? Do you know what that makes you? Beloved in God. Called. Beloved. Kept. Kept for Jesus Christ. Preserved. Enabled to endure. It's not something that God has done upon you once upon a time in the past. It's something he's ever at work doing within you. What glorious comfort, not even an entire verse in. More than one who endures, more than one who perseveres. The one who is called, the one who is beloved in God, is one who is kept. I remember a Christian in the church I grew up in, he was an elder. And he used to say something so beautiful, he would say, I just want one word written on my tombstone. Kept. So much wisdom in that. Oh, if you look at me, if you look at what I do, if you look at my performance, if you look at my ups and downs, my peaks and my valleys, my sins, and also where I've managed to be less than sinful, not a lot to look at. But God draws near to you and says, you're kept. Kept, beloved in God, and called. If you think about it, you are the ongoing work of the triune, almighty God. As if that's not enough, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. We're still just considering here, but think about how much those words mean to us. I heard a tremendous uh, account. Charles Spurgeon. And there's a lot of great stories of Spurgeon, and I guess at this point we're not always sure which ones are actually true and which ones are apocryphal, but even the apocryphal ones are often noteworthy and very helpful. This one goes like this. Spurgeon, the great pastor from the 1800s, was outside of the church building, and a woman there was complaining. And he said, What? Not in hell and complaining? That's a powerful lesson. That really gets right to the heart of it immediately. That's a, the shortest sermon I think I've ever heard. But the idea is so true for us. We, we look at our sin. We use words like total depravity, eternal damnation, the wrath of God, the eternally just wrath of God on sin and sinners. Who are we to ever complain? Not in hell? You see, that's mercy. When you have that acknowledgement that you are not in hell, that you are not receiving what your sin deserves, that God's response to you is not depart from me, I never knew you. But instead, food and family and music and beautiful weather, at least at times, 
the laughter that you can share with others and holidays and vacations and ice cream and so many good things. You come back over and over and say, that's not just mercy. That's mercy multiplied. That's mercy multiplied according to each one of my sins. That's mercy multiplied according to each one of his blessings. And that mercy has brought me to a place of peace. Now people figure out ways to establish peace with one another. Nations even occasionally figure that out through diplomacy or contracts and that sort of thing. Isn't it stunning just to stop and think that no amount of work, no, no amount of diplomacy, no, no amount of politics, no amount of contractual obligation, no amount of commitment, no amount of effort, no amount of performance could ever bring you peace with God. Even if there was a way to, from this day forward, be absolutely sinless and perfect, you'd still have an unalterable track record that cries out for damnation. And what's astonishing is those that pursued righteousness in themselves the hardest, like the Apostle Paul, realized that they were some of the worst murderers blasphemers. You see, that peace with God, it's infinitely distant if it's only you and God. There's no hope of attaining it. It's beyond. But if you're called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, Mercy and peace with God are multiplied to you day after day, forever and ever. And this is already, in a sense, Jude repeating himself, only two verses into a 25 verse chapter. But love is so paramount, he has to say it twice. You're beloved in God the Father, and his love is multiplied to you. This is who you are as a Christian. This is what it means to be a sinner saved by grace and now a saint, a servant of Jesus Christ. One who rejoices in the love of God being multiplied over and over and over to you. You are not your own. Isn't that glorious from our confession of faith? What a strange thing to say, especially in our day and age. You want to be real countercultural? You know what my only comfort in life and in death is? It's the exact opposite of what the world is crying out at the top of its lungs. You do you. Be your own person. Fulfill your dreams. Your body, your choice. You, 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 you. No, no, no. My only comfort is that I'm not my own. My only comfort is that somebody else owns me. And let me tell you about the someone. He called me. He loves me. He keeps me. He multiplies mercy to me. He multiplies peace and love to me. A recipient of his grace. Thank God I am not my own. So funny. And with great economy, Jude goes on to this third and third verse, and already he says beloved again. That's three times in three verses in a book that's only 25 verses long. So paramount is that idea of being loved by God. But in verse 3, you'll see that he does something fascinating, and he, he makes the entire book come across more strongly. We take it more seriously. We can't really make it through verse 3 without saying Wow, this is tremendously important. This needs to be a book in my life that I come back to over and over again. This needs to be a grounding element, a microcosm to the entire gospel and Bible. 
Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. See, what we've been doing up to this point has been considering, considering what it is to be loved, considering what it is to be called, considering mercy and peace and love being multiplied to us, and Judah saying, I'd love to keep writing about that, our common salvation. You can never get enough of that. It would be great to write about that. But I need to get to something even more important than speaking about our common salvation. Maybe he came across the book of Romans and said, hey, there's already a great book about our common salvation. So I'm going to switch gears here and bring it into something even more important contend for the faith that was once for all delivered. He escalates it. Not just considering, but contending for it. I want us to just think about uh, some things that are written in other places in the New Testament. Ephesians 6, verse 12, the famous passage that speaks about the full armor of God. Paul introduces the topic by saying this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. Sound familiar? Are you able to listen to the news and look at the world leaders and look at the ideas of men and all of the various ways in which people work to cast off the authority of God, their creator and maker? Are you able to see that there is real evil and that there is really good, and that there is a conflict, a spiritual warfare, an ongoing battle, that it's not just people and opinions. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Do you hear the military language, the warfare language in those verses? They come to bear in this letter from Jude. He's saying it would be great to just stay with the common salvation, our common salvation, but you need to be one who contends for the faith, one who fights the good fight, one who arms himself with the whole armor of God, one who insists on taking every thought captive, not to the latest talking head on TV or radio, but to the obedience of Jesus Christ who lives laboring in heart, strength, soul, and mind to bring thoughts, ideas, intents, feelings to Jesus Christ first and say, Lord, You are my Lord. Enable me to contend for this faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I want to hopefully bring that home to you in various ways, how this contending for the faith is even more than considering. It's even more aggressive, really. It's, it's standing on top and saying it would be wonderful to contemplate and consider, but you must contend. You must spar. You must fight. You must engage in spiritual warfare. First, look at how it's the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. 
Isn't that amazing that even during Scripture being written, although towards the end of it, the second to last book of the Bible, Jude could speak about a faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And I think as Presbyterians and Protestants, you can follow where I'm going with this. It's critical. He's saying, go back to the apostles. Listen to their warnings. Listen to what they say. Listen to their predictions. Think of the faith as being once for all delivered to the saints. Read your Bible. Know it. Read your confession. Read your catechisms. Understand your theology. Know your doctrine. It has everything to do with every moment that you live. Here's where it's at. The faith once for all delivered to the saints. Study it. Understand it. Bring it to bear in your life. Hold every thought captive to the obedience for Christ. Go back to God's Word over and over. Be the ultimate chapter and verse. People, thus saith the Lord. Here's something else that's amazing, though, about this concept of contending. Certainly that. But I want you to hear something in the the Greek word that's translated as contending. The word is ep agonoitsestai. And right in the middle, and you may have heard it, is the word agony. The word agony is right in the middle of this word contend. And I think we all understand that. Sports is probably the easiest way for us to uh, gather the meaning, right? No pain, no gain. There's a pain, there's an agony associated with contending the way you are meant to contend. Don't you feel that in this day and age? You're trying to maintain not only the truth of God, but the love of God, the grace of God, the fact that God is the friend of sinners, The fact that God became man and would eat under the roof of sinful tax collector Zacchaeus. That God who became man and never committed evil would speak with prostitutes. Would speak with those who had committed adultery. Was not just concerned to correct unrighteousness, but to correct self-righteousness. You see, it's this ongoing, contending, even agony. Lord, teach me, however we say it, to hate the sin but love the sinner. Teach me what it is to hate what you hate, to love what you love, but to have grace in my heart for someone who sins just like me. And even more, Lord, because this is what I find harder to do, and it's what we all find harder to do. Give me grace to love somebody who sins in ways other than the way I find it easiest to sin. Lord, give me this heart of Christ who amidst the darkness of the earth, hanging on a cross by those who would murder him unjustly, would pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lord, bring me to contend for the faith, the faith once for all delivered to the saints, brought to us through the writings of the apostles. Help us to be willing to stand there unmovingly, thoroughly committed to the Word of God, the whole counsel of God, The thus saith the Lord, even hating what God hates and loving what God loves. But Lord, enable me, keep me in this agony of contention, the agony of being in a world that seems bent on casting off the only authority that can deliver, that can deliver. Not just considering 
contending. Contending in this way that does mean an agony. And then, because I think it's necessary and particularly our circles as we focus on a sermon like this that rejoices in the faith once for all delivered to the saints, and a sermon that says, unmovingly committed to the Word of God, and that once for all delivered faith. Jude, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, contend for the faith. Not be contentious for the faith. There is a world of difference between the agony, the contending, this sort of contending for the faith once for all delivered, and being contentious, sparring, a know-it-all, browbeating, heavy-handed, looking down on other believers, esteeming self, Consider Christ, the gentleness, the meekness, that he comes to us in our lowly condition, that he didn't come to the world the way he showed himself to be during the transfiguration, but came holy, harmless, undefiled, born a babe in a poor family in a barn, lived among us, and consistently throughout his entire life went out of his way to break things down for people, to ask loving questions, to provide miraculous provision, to care, to love. Not contentious, though always contending for the faith. As we consider the world we live in, all the ways this applies to us as we think of just a world that consistently comes up with something diametrically opposed to what Scripture teaches, opposite to the faith delivered through the saints. It's easy to get discouraged. So easy. I don't know anybody who doesn't get discouraged during an election season. But I want this last thought to be one in which you, you take a step back and reflect on the microcosm of these three verses within the microcosm of Jude. This is just stunning. Hear these words. If we think that Satan has engineered against this generation with what craftiness he labors to subvert the faith, then the warnings which were profitable in the time of Jude are all the more needed in our own generation. You hear what that's saying? If, if Satan is this crafty in his work, in his assault, in his attack, in his craftiness, in his engineerings against this generation, if this is the sort of thing Satan does, then this book of Jude, this microcosm, will be all the more profitable in our own generation. That's what John Calvin wrote in 1551. Almost 500 years ago, John Calvin, assessing the Reformation, came across the book of Jude and said, we need this even more than they did 1,500 years ago when it was first written. Do you see that? The word of the Lord endures forever. Sure, election seasons, they're disappointing. They can even become depressing. We might need to take a news fast once in a while. When we think about what people say is true and compare it to what we know is true according to the Word of God, our heads start spinning at points. But look at how the Lord keeps His people. The generation in A.D. 60, A.D. 65, around there, was under the assault of Satan. And God raised up Jude, the brother of James and servant of Jesus, 
to write them a letter saying it's great to consider these things, but you need to contend for them. 1,500 years later, John Calvin brought that same message to the inheritors of the Protestant Reformation. And almost 500 years after that, here we are, Columbus, Ohio, saying we're Reformed, we're Presbyterians, we rejoice and delight in the faith committed to the saints once for all. God's word is my word. And we have the testimony of even history reminding us the Holy Spirit is at work through his word, keeping you his people. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we pray that this word would preach into our lives, that when we say your word is living and active, it would be a true statement for us on a personal level that you reach in, you restore our souls, you feed us, you enable us to feast on Jesus Christ and all he means. Thank you, Lord, for using the word love three times in these verses. Thank you for the delight and joy of considering our faith. Bring us to actively, relentlessly, steadfastly contend for this faith once for all delivered to the saints. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.